All right. Thank you, Tony. Morning, everyone. Um, is this good, the mic? We good? All right. Um, right. Just quickly about me before I start. Um, most of you know me, actually, but for those who don't, I've been around the cable space for 20, 25 years uh, in a variety of different roles, kind of startup, worked at Liberty Global, worked at Technetics, worked at a few other places, Teleste. So uh, I've been around uh, a couple of these technologies. And um, yeah, if anyone has any questions about the sources of today's slides, um, I tried to put the references in there, but they're all reference. I was kind of doing it last minute, so we can talk about it if you want. Doxus and Pond, a love story. Let's go into this. It's actually, I was trying to find out a catchy title. I don't know if I managed it or not, but the idea behind this is, you know, let's look at what these technologies have in common rather than, you know, what separates them because there is actually a lot that they have in common. Um, and what does that mean for the future? Where are we at? How do we get here? What's happening from this point? That's, that's really the discussion. If you want to interrupt me, please do. If you want to uh, not heckle questions, comments, challenges, I'd love it because um, that's how this is supposed to be. So let's just kind of dive into it. Doxis and Pon, right? What do they have in common? Well, they're both standards. They're both standards um, that have been approved by the ITU. Um, that's uh, just a simple fact, looking for commonality. Um, they're both have a spot on the electromagnetic spectrum. I don't know if that's coming through that well. It's not on here, but you know, the cable stuff is down here. The radio waves, you know, you know, from uh, up to like 1.8 gig. I guess Doxis 4 is going to operate up there, and Pan is up here, you know, in the visible light spectrum for the most part. This is very basic stuff, but for people that don't know, it's kind of good to see it laid out. I, I find it useful, um, but. You know, without staying too long on simple things, ChatGPT is really interesting to ask some of these questions too. According to ChatGPT, they both deliver high-speed broad internet um, to residential and business com customers. Um, they're both point, I guess, the ugh, water. They're both point to multi-point access network technologies. Um, and wh what's weird is they've both been around about the same amount of time, but Doxis has really grown uh, quite, quite a lot over the last 20 years, whereas Pond's really taking off only since about 2010 or so. Um, there's some reasons behind that. Um, a look at the current speed capability, in case anyone in the room doesn't know, uh, but I think most of these people would know. HFC, DOCSIS 3.1. Um, DOCSIS 3.1 is actually pretty good technology. It, it improved greatly on DOCSIS 3 as far as getting bits through the spectrum. Um, and, you know, it is possible to pump 10 gigabits through DOCSIS 3 using wide band channels and really realigning the spectrum, which is actually pretty difficult for most operators to actually do. But it is theoretically possible. DOCSIS 4, as we know, is really lifting that bar uh, with higher qualms and better speeds and, and wider channels. Um, GPON, you know, was pretty capable, whereas XGS PON really lifted the bar for PON with the, the full symmetrical 10 gigabit, really. And that's, you know, operating on the same passive network, passive uh, fibers. 25 gig PON has actually already been announced and uh, is out there uh, in the market a little bit. Um, but there's actually more bars that you can add here because 100 gig PON is already being demonstrated. Um, it's not really commercially available for the most part, but it is out there and will become eventually a consumer technology uh, w when the chipsets uh, become available, which is inevitable. And there's, there's stuff beyond that as well. So unfortunately for Doxis, you can kind of see that um, PON is pulling away as far as this, the speed capability that it can do. Um, so, you know, I think, 
I think it's just important to look at it high level and, and understand where they stack up. Docs is five. It's not even being talked about uh, at this point. I don't know, maybe some people know more than me, the cable apps people, but if you look at the silicone side of this, um, there's a question mark. Even the silicone market for Docs is four, um, I would say it's pretty challenging if you look at who's investing in that and uh, what it takes to, to, to develop a next generation silicone. So, and, and Broadcom's really got a stranglehold on that, right? So, and uh, it's actually pretty expensive to develop it as well. So the market has, has got to be there and uh, it's unlikely, but not impossible. Um, looking back, right, at Doxis for a minute, um, this slide's really about that downstream capacity and the upstream capacity slide, just kind of, and also the timeline. Um, Doxus was quick out of the gate, you know, to get to, to gigabit services. That, it got there fast, right? But it kind of stalled out um, there for a while. And actually, even if you look at, I don't know, you probably a lot of broadband users out there now, the average users still probably aren't getting full gigabit if they really look, but they could be. Um, 10 gigabit, yeah, it's possible with Doxus 3.1, but you don't really see it out in the wild very often. This is really niche, niche stuff. Um, when you compare that, all oh, right. Um, okay, the next slide's going into power. So looking at the technology side by side, which is kind of the, um, the idea of this presentation, um, I found this report that was written by Prismian. Uh, it's a little bit old, right? It's about 10 years old, but the stuff on power I found kind of interesting because, well, back before, I don't think uh, anyone thought about power consumption when they were looking into end-to-end -end network construction. We just never did. We didn't think about it very much. Um, if you look at the bottom numbers there, you can see um, that DOCSIS, HFC, it's pretty power hungry, right? When you compare that with GPON, um, it's significantly less. Now, GPON, XGS PON, which is the most uh, current version of PON technology, I'm gonna go ahead and leap and say the power consumption's about the same. Um, the power consumption of DOCSIS 4 is actually higher than uh, DOCSIS 3 or DOCSIS 3.1, which is this is based on. Why? Because your bandwidth is larger and you're consuming more. Um, so, kind of looking ahead, um, I think power consumption is certainly something that's become a lot more um, contentious. Uh, it's become a, a lot more um, question of sustainability. Um, why are we uh, why are we consuming so much power when there's technology that allows us to do the same job with less power? I mean, the best way to save power is to do the same thing using less power, right? So I think that uh, that is becoming more of a goal of the industry at large, and, and we need to think about it more. Um, this is pretty much um, doing the same thing, except you can see the kilowatt I like this one because it, it tells the kilowatt consumption per person. Now, yeah, you can see, you know, if you're gonna do broadband, we should be thinking about doing this with the least amount of power, because we all need this at home. So this actually matters in society somehow. This is a fussy chart. Um, I wasn't sure if I should put it in, but if you, and again, it's, it's quite old, but it's interesting. Um, it's from the same Prismian report. But you can see um, from a power consumption compared with the data rates that um, DOCSIS kind of steps up and does pretty well up to a gigabit. But after that, it stalls out, right? And the other technologies also kind of reach reach a limit where um, the threshold for power versus, you know, data isn't that good. But perhaps that's too much to explain for me right now. <laughs> um, so 
keeping all of that in mind with Doxis and now kind of flicking over to the other side of this uh, story is what was happening over in the fiber world whilst Doxis was moving from Doxis 1 to 2 to 3 and trying to thinking about delivering consumer speeds of like 100 meg which sounded good at one time but then wasn't that good and with fiber optic technology, the, the invention of, of digital optics really exploded the speeds that it was capable to deliver with simple, pluggable technology. And what you can see here, uh, maybe it's the next one, oh, the, the dates. So on this chart, I would say focus on the speed, right? But also when these speeds and capabilities were released. They were making huge improvements during this time while Doxis was just kind of creeping along, right? But this is a little bit further back in the network, of course. Um, you, you, no one is plugging SFPs in a home yet. But, but what it does is change the backhaul situation and, you know, the network that's supporting all of these technologies. And eventually, all of this stuff filters out to the edge. So the invention of, of digital pluggable technology really changed their speeds, right, in, in a different way. And I, this is one of the things, I believe, that really started driving uh, the proliferation of PON and other types of fiber technologies. Their speeds just pulled away. And, and, and they're pluggable. They're, they're, most of these technologies don't require that much um, management and maintenance. And they're, they're so cheap, if they break, you can just plug in a new one most of the time, right? So it, it, it's, a different, it's a different way uh, of doing things, but because um, it got so fast, it affected. It affected things, right? Um, the other thing that happened, I was, trying to, I was trying to find some information about how much fiber cable was being produced over time. Because back in the day, in the early stages, fiber was actually a little bit harder to get. It was a bit more specialized. And um, that changed at a certain point. And what this chart is really showing here is, all right, we've got, so this is the annual installation of optical cables. This is the installations, right, in kilometers, fiber kilometers. Um, the data is from CRU. But this... This area here, I guess, I, I'm not good with colors, but that sort of off-white color, it's China, right? So when China started to build their own PON networks, um, CPON, I think it started out, became GPON, things really changed, and the amount of fiber in the world exploded. So fiber went from being a little bit scarce to being much cheaper. Combine that with the speeds, now, if you're building a network, you're gonna, you're, what are you going to pick, right? You're going to pick something that, that's cheaper and faster. Well, that's what we all want to do. If it consumes less power, that's just a benefit, you know, if, you, if you're building a network. So the rise of, of China as far as installing networks, innovating in networks, producing fiber, presumably, although I'm not an expert in exactly where it's all produced, I think it's mainly India anyway. It doesn't really matter where it's produced, but the production and installation of fiber really exploded around 2010, 2011. Um, the other thing, looking at fiber generally, is um, the way to track it is looking at the price, right? So this chart showing us the price of fiber over time starting in 2004, the price and the, and the availability and the demand of fiber. So the dotted line is, is the price of fiber. It, when, the, when the supply was restricted, the price was high. As the supply rose, the price came down. Um, but, then, but then there kind of became a glut, right, of fiber. Um, 2015, things uh, started to change, and then the fiber production was really high. The price of fiber became very low. This chart ends around 2010. There's question marks here. Um, but actually, COVID happened right at the end of this chart, and there's question marks of where, what happens to the price after this. Anybody want to guess what happened? Did the price stay low? It didn't. 
Uh, the price shot up. The demand for fiber exploded again, contrary to what we thought it was going to do. And this is another chart by the St. Louis Fed. It shows the same thing, except it shows what happened in 2002, uh, 2022, 2024. The demand for fiber spiked again, and the price spiked. It's impossible to get all of a sudden. Why? Because everyone realizes they needed to have it again. So um, not all of this has been linear or predictable. Uh, telecoms is, is a bit up and down uh, cyclical business. But when you try and kind of look back, um, what I probably should have done is also kind of looked at the price of, of coax and copper. I don't think we would have seen a, a spike in the price uh, of coaxial cable in 2022. But I'm not sure. That's something I would, I would check. We did. I'm getting a nod from the back. Um, so where does that where does that leave us now today? Actually, I was thinking about a, a global, but I, I ended up finding this um, this slide from Ofcom, uh, who we all love, by the way. Not everybody does, uh, but it kind of tells the status of the UK um, as far as broadband penetration and speeds, right? So we're going to talk through this for a second. Um, the gigabit capable number down here, let's call it 70% for the UK as a whole. For the most part, that's really version. You know, it's the coaxial for the most part. Full fiber, 42% available uh, for residential. You know, super fast, super fast, they say, uh, I can't remember what it was. It's more than 50 megabits, something like that. 97% uh, they're claiming that's actually pretty good. Well, we need to get to the last 3%, definitely. Um, so, you know, what is this telling us here? Well, there's been discussions this morning uh, of, of coffee about um, how it's a shame that there's so many altnets fighting for the same customers. And that is true. Maybe it's good for consumers, though, because we all want a connection that's stable and low price. But, yeah, 42%. Well, it's still kind of low. There's still room for us to grow with full fiber. We know it's delivering much better speeds. It's actually consuming less power. This is good, generally. Um, the gigabit capable, this is, this is really the DOCSIS. So what we see here is DOCSIS and PON together covering the UK pretty well. You know, they're doing a pretty good job as a team, right? Uh, are we going to see the, the version networks grow? Their DOCSIS network? Unlikely. Um, are we going to see the altnets grow? Definitely, although some of them will probably die first or be consumed by, by others, right? So let's keep going. Um, this kind of waterfall chart is looking at the various technology types over time. DSL is on here. Cable is on here. Fiber is on here, and it's going from two, it's really small numbers, but on the left-hand side is 2011, and on the right-hand side is 2030. So we're, we're in the middle of, we're, we're about here. What year is it? 2024? That's hard to believe. We're about right here. Um, as you can see, that huge gaping uh, growing section is the pond section. It's, it's actually no surprise based on what we know about it. But the orange section that kind of starts big and grows down, that's the doxus. That's the doxus slice. Um, what do we, what do we, what can we interpolate from this? Well, yeah, we know pond is growing. Why? It's cheaper, faster, better. Only problem is you have to construct it in a lot of places and that's expensive. But anywhere where you're going to touch the network, that's what you're doing if you're an operator. That's where you're spending your money. Why? Because you can upgrade it in the future by just changing the endpoints, and you don't have to do anything to the to the to the connecting sections most of the time. But what I find interesting, I mean, but that's kind of obvious, yeah. If you're investing money in a network right now, you're building pond for sure. But the doxis doesn't go away. It's 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 it is getting smaller. It's shrinking, right? But it doesn't disappear, right? This is where the love story comes in because all the cable operators now are becoming pawn operators. Um, 
they're ceasing to even call themselves cable operators now. They're, they're blending over, right? But the networks will persist for a very long time. Why is that? Well, we already paid for them. That's the main thing. Uh, they generate a lot of cash, which we all like, right? If you're running a business, you know, cable has always been a great cash business. Uh, that's why it's attracted so many investors. The problem with this is, um, is that, you know, it, as it sort of tails down, there's a skill shortage and there's questions about, you know, the roadmap of the technology. And so it makes it harder to, to look down the pike a little bit. Um, but it doesn't go away. So, you know, I think we can, we can feel co confident, you know, as a cable industry that, that that's pretty important, it's, it's good, it means we've done good work, we can be proud about it. But it's actually gonna become harder to manage because there are every year fewer and fewer people that wanna come in to learn about it, to do it. What we found, and I've actually worked on both on the, the fiber pond OLT side of the business and, and the DOCSIS side for a reasonable long time. DOCSIS and the whole segments, it's actually pretty complicated to run it all. Um, it's very complex uh, when you look at the channels, the CMTSs, what it, what it takes to manage long cascades of, of, of amplifiers. Um, we do a lot of work to, to design it, to maintain it, to uh, keep it alive. We have a lot of skills is what I'm trying to say. And you find when you're deploying other technology, it's much simpler. This is why in many cases it's easier and better. But DOCSIS is very complex. So what I'm trying to say with that is, you know, it, we have a lot of skills that, that can be repurposed um, and that are actually portable if you kind of get into the right mindset. So I'm gonna try to kind of roll this off now, but Conclusions, right? Um, cable shrinks but doesn't really die. We need to, I think we need to keep that in mind. When people want to say cable is dead, well, not really because it's in the ground and it still works and it still generates a lot of money. And if you're touching that network, you'll probably convert it to fiber if you can, but not everyone can do that. Certainly in Europe, it's pretty expensive to dig up a street. Um, so you, you got to think about it carefully. Fiber rises to dominate the access network. This is an unassailable fact that we just gotta get comfortable with it and figure it out, right? Um, the skill shortage in DOCSIS um, is a problem, but there's also a shortage of skills in PON. So because there's so much of it being done, um, there aren't enough people coming in to do this generally, but it's particularly acute in DOCSIS. So what does that mean? Automation becoming more important. Operational challenges will get worse. Troubleshooting is difficult. It's very manual. Um, the kind of people that can do it are, are difficult to find. But again, it's because of the complexity and the number of things that can go wrong in a DOCSIS network. Um, plus, you know, there's leakage. There's, there's lots of different things. It can get kind of boring and uh, none of the test equipment people are here yet. So uh, you, need a lot of, you need a lot of stuff. DOCSIS and POM will remain physically separate, but they will join up in the control plane. Eventually, you'll just be managing like apps on your phone, the different types of technology. Um, it'll be like having tapes and CDs, you know. They will become less and less like industries and more just like technology you have to manage. Automation, I don't want to go on and, about AI and all of that, but it will definitely grow to try and solve a lot of, of the skill shortage, but also the abstraction layers will start to merge. They already am, probably are merging um, with platforms that can already manage both DOCSIS and PON, um, and a lot of vendors are already doing it. This will happen more and more. It's gonna get harder to, to you know, recruit more people into DOCSIS as the percentage shrinks. Who wants to learn about a, a technology that is basically a cul-de-sac? Um, for a new entry. So I think we'll struggle to get some young people to come in, uh, but it's, it's nice to see some young faces in here. So um, I, I guess that's also good. The ride is over yet for cable, but it is slowing down. Um, 
you know, I was lucky enough to start in this business around the year 2000 where it was booming. It, it, it boomed for a long time, actually, uh, longer than I thought it would. But you start to see it slowing down. The vendors are getting smaller. They're fighting for the same business. And they there probably will be consolidation and mergers and, and more, um, more consolidation on, on the technology and, and business side of it because the customers are, are fixed and they only have a certain amount of money to spend on DOCSIS. And that's not growing very much. What they're spending on fiber, though, is still growing. Um, so, yeah, I want to round this up kind of saying the DOCSIS network is pretty complex. When you start working over on fiber, you do realize a lot of it is much simpler. So the skills that we have learned um, in DOCSIS are definitely very portable. And for the people, some of us that are looking for jobs, I am actually not looking for a job, but I don't have a job right now. I think we can be proud. <laughs> we can be proud and happy, actually, uh, how much knowledge we have that we don't even know we have, right? Because running it and selling or installing or planning, architecting DOCSIS network, it's complex stuff. Uh, not very many people are good at it. Um, Pawn, it's just going to keep growing. The speeds are going to increase. Um, and the networks look very similar at the end of the day um, at the level of software eventually. And the physical network uh, will kind of shrink away. So I'm kind of stop talking very soon and ask for questions. But um, thank you very much for listening to me. And that's about it. Go for it. Oh, Mike. Right. Um, I can hear you. I'll, I'll repeat it okay. if people can't hear. How are you doing? Um, in the previous slide about the trends, you I think you had a, um, the last blue was other. Is that um, 4G, 5G, or is it uh, radio access systems, or what, what, what does that Actually, this, this one is fixed, fixed networks. I didn't really bring in too much. Uh, it's a good point. Yeah, if you look at what's happened in the mobile technology during this time, 3G, 4G, 5G, fixed wireless access, yeah, it's definitely really changing uh, what's possible. It's getting pretty good. Um, and it's actually really supporting some of the stuff like rural broadband. Um, yeah, but for this, uh, it was a little too much for me to try to tackle all of that. Um, having said that, I would also add, because I'm also a customer, low Earth orbit satellites, stuff like Starlink is really also taking a chunk out of, of some of these. So again, this is a little bit um, focused on the fixed network side of it. When, when you're talking about POM, I think you actually mean fiber access networks, don't you? You don't mean passive optical networks all the time, or are you just specifically talking about passive ones? I mean, a lot of the alt nets don't use POM, they use tree and branch sort of systems. Is it significant, a number? I don't know. Some, some of the alt nets are using point-to-point -point systems. Um, the ones that I know that did that are, are ripping it and replacing it with, with PON. Um, I don't think th the ones that I know are, but they're probably a bit of a mix. They're probably a bit of a mix. Uh, the ones that I know that put in point to point are regretting it. Let's just put it like that. But perhaps they're not all. It kind of depends on the model, right? Um, if, you, if you're going for the wholesale model, it maybe looks different if you're you know, only looking at residential. So. Um, a bit of waffle, but for the most part, I'm talking about G pawn and XGS pawn. Good, good question though, because some of the alt nets do actually use a point-to-point -point system. Do you want some information on that? Yes, please. Um, I know it's your presentation. Apologies. 
Um, it's about 80% pawn, 20% point to point. There you um, go. The point to point is it's the beta max VHS war. Um, beta's technically better. VHS got the content. And pawn is much easier to deploy than, obviously, subject to light levels, much easier yeah. to deploy, but uh, point to point is much more robust. Uh, but it should really be kept in the building, not yes. actually out in the street. Um, but it's rolled out. Um, the customers I'm talking to that have got point to point are sticking with it, the ones I'm talking to anyway, at least, uh, because they've made the investment and they don't want to spend twice. But it is a very difficult network to upgrade once you've rolled it out. You can't put extra customers on because you can't just optically splice. Yeah, so, it might be great for a business, you know, a business approach. It is, that's uh, what I'm saying. It's an yeah. in-house business to business technology that's yes. rolled out into the street. And, yeah. uh, but it is about 20% of the network, so. Okay, uh, good stat, yeah. thank you. Good comment as well. Anyone else? Cool. Well, thank you very much for listening to me. It was fun. Uh, and thank you, SCT, for inviting me.